Well, good morning. And uh, I just have one thing that I would like to say to you all. I love you. I, oh, thank you. I love you guys. And, and I, I'm not saying that because of our Love First series. Uh, I'm saying it because I genuinely do feel that way. I do love you all. Um, but it does happen to go with our series today. So I love you. Those three words are three probably the most powerful words in our English vocabulary. I love you. And those words are, they're powerful. They have the, the power to heal wounds. You know, someone who's hurting and you tell them that I love you. And you genuinely mean it. That, that has some power to it. Power to heal wounds. It's got power to ignite passion. I love you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm looking at you, girl. <laughs> She's blood red. I love you can also bring a smile, as it just did. I love you. Those are, they are powerful words, and, and, and love is a powerful thing, not just powerful words. And many people don't actually understand love. Uh, maybe they've seen it done incorrectly. Uh, maybe you, we've heard the term love, and, and we think we might know what love is, but uh, we don't quite understand what, what true love is and what actual love is. And maybe we've seen it done incorrectly. Maybe we've walked through some abuse. Uh, some abuse maybe has taken place in the name of love, and it's been called love, but that's not what love is. And so many people don't actually understand love. Sometimes we confuse it with sex. We confuse love with with money, uh, we can confuse love with gifts. It's easy to, to confuse these things when we don't know what uh, true love is. But uh, in spite of all the, the, the counterfeit of love, in spite of what the world may tell us what love is or what preconceived notions of love is, despite misunderstandings of what love is or, or even despite abuse, love is still powerful. True love is still very incredibly powerful. And I, I believe that Deep down in every single person, every single human being, we have this innate need for love. If you boil everything down, every, you know, psychologically you look at, look at all the issues that people may have, and if, if you boil it all down in a raw sense, it's, it's essentially that I just, I just want to be loved. I just need to be loved. I've been chasing love, looking for love in all the wrong places, Might have some, some song quotes in here today. <laughs> what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> dilly dilly. <laughs> if you can't laugh, whew, I'm sorry for you. Uh, so what is love? The world needs it. I'll tell you that. Love is powerful. God's kind of love is an incredible life-changing kind of love. We talked about that just a little bit already this morning. But love is powerful, and it is something that our world desperately needs so very much. We all need love. So what is love? To help us understand love a little bit more, we're beginning a series titled Love First. In case you were wondering what we're doing here today, Love First. Okay, love first. We're getting ready to start a series about love, and today is the first day in that. And so I want to open with, with 1 Corinthians 13, 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter, and I love love, so this is one of my favorites. But we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, chapter 13, and we're going to begin here in verse 13, the very last verse. And this is kind of the... the um, overarching theme here. We talked a little bit about this actually at Christmas, if you were here for our Christmas service, but it says this. So now faith, hope, and love abide. Faith, hope, and love remain. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the greatest. Love is the best, man. Love is awesome. Love is great. It's the greatest. And it comes above and before all the rest of these things. All the other things in life, love comes first. 
And that's why we're talking about love first today, okay? And we're gonna use this, this, um, we're gonna use this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 because it is such a beautifully painted picture of what love is. And it's one that, have you all ever read 1 Corinthians 13 or heard it? Show of hands, who, who has had, okay, just about every single person in here has heard 1 Corinthians 13. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've probably heard 1 Corinthians 13. It's beautiful. What, it talks about what love is. It's very, it's just, it's, it's wonderful. The, the, the thing about hearing things, and, and, and everyone who has heard this before, is sometimes it's easy to become jaded towards a subject where we see or hear all the time. It's easy to, to hear, oh yeah, 1 Corinthians 13, I know all about that one. And it's easy to, to miss the power, the impact that those words and that scripture, that passage has. And so what we're going to do today and, and, and the next uh, couple of weeks is we're going to talk about love and we're going to use uh, 1 Corinthians 13, but we're also going to look outside of that at some other passages as well and talk about what is love? How does it impact our life? What, what do we do with this thing called love? And so today we're going to start and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 uh, and we're going we're gonna to use it to, to start our study in love. But before we do jump in, Let's pose the actual question, what is love? What is love? What is this thing love? Is it an emotion? Is it a feeling? Like if you went up to someone on the street and said, what's love? What is love? It's kind of a hard question to answer. If you, well, well um, that's a tough one. What is love? Is it an emotion? Is it a feeling? Is, it, is all love the same? You know, in the English language, there's one word for love. It's love. Uh, but we use that word in all different kinds of ways, and, and let me explain what I mean by that. If I sit here and I say, I love my wife, and then I tell you that I love my child. I love my wife and my child in two different ways. They're two completely different ways. I could also sit here and tell you that I love ice cream, and I love the Kentucky Wildcats, but I don't love them the same way that I love my wife or my child. It's a different kind of love, but it's the same word, love, right? So you could sit here, and if somebody asked you what is love, you could explain how you love ice cream, and that would be, you know, a, a, a partial definition of what love is. I feel this way towards ice cream. I love it in my belly. It's refreshing and cool, delightfully delectable. It is the greatest. <laughs> we should basically just change the name of ice cream to love. So the question is, what kind of love is Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians 13? Is he talking about the love of ice cream? Probably not, but we're going to see. Did you know that while, while we only have one word for love, that the Greek language, which is what the New Testament is written in, actually has four? Did you know that? The Greek language has four different words of love. And so to help us to understand a little bit more about what Paul is talking about, let's dive in to the, the, the language here. The first word is Eros, and that's spelled E-R-O-S. You can see it. Look, it's up there on the screen. Eros. This word is the Greek word for sexual love and desire. It is where we get the word erotic. Makes sense, right? Eros was also the name of the Greek god of love, which uh, you probably know the Roman name for the god of love is Cupid. So the Greek God, his name was, was love. And, and by the time the New Testament was written, this word, eros, had been so debased by culture that it was left out of the, in, in the New Testament entirely because it became, had become so sexually perverted, and that was the connotation used with that type of love, that it's not actually, you won't find it in, in, in New Testament scripture. And so that's one type of love. Word number two, storge, as you can see, storge. This kind of a love r relates to a familial love. It's like that of a parent to a child. So like the love that I would have for Kitely, my daughter, is a storge kind of a love. It, is a, a, it comes naturally. It is unforced. I didn't have to, do, no one had to tell me how to love my child just by having her and being a dad that came naturally. And so 
That, that, what we're talking about there is a sorge kind of love. It's instinctual. It also is actually not found in the New Testament. But it's negative form. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, about how in the Greek language, when you put a in front of a word, it would mean like the opposite of that word. And so storge is our word, but astorgos is actually used twice in the New Testament. First in Romans 1, chapter 31, and that describes sinful humanity as having no understanding, no fidelity, no love, and no mercy. Paul is describing what a sinful humanity is, and he's saying here that 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 kind of a humanity, they don't even love their own families. Like there's, there's no instinctual love that's naturally there that should be there with a, a bond between a, a, a parent and a child. A sinful humanity doesn't even have that. So understanding that, that, that kind of gives us a little bit of a different perspective on that scripture, but we have to understand the different forms of, or words of love in the Greek language. And so that was the, while, while storge is not actually in the New Testament, its opposite is, and that helps us to understand a little bit more. Still not the love that Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's move to the next one. Phileo or philia is the next kind of a love. And if you combine that with Adelphos, you would get Philadelphia, which means brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia means. So that's an easy way to kind of remember that. Philia or Philio is a brotherly kind of a love. It is something that is... Um, it's, all, it's also the same kind of a love for like your best friend. It's an affectionate type of a love. It's a love that wishes to, to, to please the other person, to make them happy. Uh, the same kind of the love that I have for my best friend, which is a different love than I have for my wife. Unless my wife's my best friend, then, which she is. It's a brotherly kind of a love. It's an affectionate kind of a love. It's a generous and affectionate love that seeks to make each other happy. It involves feelings of warmth and affection. Just think about the way that you feel towards your best friend or towards your brother, hopefully towards your brother. Hopefully you're not one of those. It's, you have an affectionate type of love towards your brother. And this is a, an example of this would be like David and Jonathan. It's a David and Jonathan kind of love. It's a, it's a, it's a strong bond between uh, two people who, who affectionately care about one another in a, in a greater way than I just like you. Hey, you're my buddy. It's a, it's a deep and stronger kind of a love. Storge. This is not the kind of love. Remember in the New Testament when Jesus commands us to love your enemies? Remember that? This is not that kind of a love. You don't have brotherly love towards your enemies. You have what is the next kind of a love, which is the fourth and final one, which you may have heard of, agape love. Anybody ever heard the term agape? Did you know what it meant? Yeah, agape love. We're about to dive into that a little bit here. Agape love is, is, is pretty cool. It's actually unique. It was, used, um, it was used rarely before the New Testament, but specifically in the New Testament, it was used to describe God's kind of a love. Okay, so that's why this is, this is really cool. It is a, um, it's a no-strings-attached kind of a love. It's, it's a I-put-you-before-me kind of a love. It is an unmerited and gracious kind of a love. It's a goodwill, benevolence, and a willful delight in the object kind of a love. So I just want to just think about this. Every time that we read about God loving us, and we seeing, see, hear about God's love for you. It's this kind of a love right here, this kind of a love right here, that it's unmerited, that it's gracious, that is a willful delight in you, the, the object or the subject of that love. How cool, like what kind of a cool picture is that? You have a willful delight in me. That's the kind of a love that God has. It is not used, uh, not referred to romantic or sexual love or brotherly love or even close friendship. It involves faithfulness, commitment, and here's the best part of agape love. It involves an act of will. This is why Jesus can command us to love because it's not based upon feeling. It's based upon an act of your will. It's me deciding I'm going to love you. It's unmerited. There's no strings attached. It's not a feelings kind of a love. It's not just the way that I feel about you. It's an unmerited kind of a love. 
And it's distinguished from other types of love by its lofty moral nature and its strong character. Remember, this kind of love, agape love, is used to describe God. It's that kind of a love. It's not, uh, this, this is the love. Remember in, in, in 1 John, it says God is love. This is the word, agape. God is agape. This is what he is. This is used to describe his nature, the characteristics of God. It's not a sentimental and sappy feeling. It is his nature, and it is an expression of his very being. God is love. This is who he is. He is the source of agape love. And agape love is shown by what it does. It's not just, you know, we talk about love with action. It's not just a sentiment or a feeling or me just saying, hey, I love you. I love you because Jesus told me to love you, so I love you. No, it's actually an action that accompanies the love. And God demonstrated that, his agape love, through Jesus on the cross, which is what we've talked about already. And we are called to love others with this kind of a love, with agape love, not the other kinds of love, this specific kind of love, agape love. We're called to, to love others, which I'm going to group into two different categories. Category number one, others, is other believers. Other believers in Jesus Christ. Let's look at that scripture, John 13 and 34. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. If you don't, look up on the screen, and we will read it together. It says this, a new commandment I give to you. This is Jesus speaking. This is red letter, straight up Jesus speaking. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And also, you also are to love one another. Just as I love you, you are to love others. Guess what that word love there means? Agape. It's agape kind of a love. It's not eros. Just as I have sexually desired you, you are to sexually desire others. I'm sure there are many people who would think, well, that's a great way to live. That's not what Jesus is talking about. See, this is why it's important to understand how to read the Bible, because you can take and misinterpret scripture and make it whatever you want. That's why it's important to understand the context and understand the language because in our English language, we are limited to the word love. And I could take that however I want. But looking at it this way, I understand more clearly he's not talking about sexual love. He's not talking about familial love. He's not talking storge. And he's not talking philia or phileo, a brotherly or close friend kind of love. He's talking agape love. This is a whole nother concept of kind of a love. Agape love. We are to love other believers and other Christians with agape love. Second category is your bitter enemy. Matthew chapter five and verse 44. We just said this just a few seconds ago. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is that same kind of love, agape love. Loving your enemies, a willful delight. This is not a a brotherly love. This is different than that. Now, maybe you can begin loving them in an agape kind of a love and love them into brotherly love. Does that make sense? That I choose to love you so much out of will, not out of feeling, not based on the way that I feel about you. We may disagree on so many things. I hate the way that you treat me. I hate the way that you talk bad about me. I hate the decisions that you're making but I love you. I choose to love you with an agape love because it's not based about me and my feeling. It's me commanding my will to say, I love you. I choose to love you. I choose to love first. That's what it's about. That's this kind of agape love, which is why you could sit here and think, well, how can I command my emotions? Agape love is not an emotion. It's a willful act. It is unmerited. There are no strings attached. You don't have to do anything for me for me to agape love you. I choose to agape love you because that's what my father did for me. And he commanded me. He didn't just suggest to me. He commanded me to do the same for others. Not just people who I actually like, but people who I really don't like or who don't like me. (laughs) That's agape kind of a love. And here's one of the really cool things about agape love. We know that it's not determined on feeling. Uh, And we know that it is an act of determined will. But agape love, 
Unlike the, the storge love, the love from a parent to a child, agape love does not come naturally. It, we are not automatically born or automatically have agape love until we receive it from its source, God. God is agape. And when we receive him, then the love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that's the agape love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now we can carry and distribute agape love. It did not come naturally. It came supernaturally through a rebirthing through the source itself of agape love, God the Father. Amen? That's exciting because that, tell, that tells me today that, you know what? I can love like you love. I can love like you love. It's not out of my, my, my strength. It's because of the Holy Spirit and the love that you have, have given uh, to me and through me and shed through me so that others can see. It's all this working and power of the Holy Spirit and receiving the love of God. I can now walk in that, and I can do that, and I can choose to do that because, see, it's a choice. It's a willful choice. So today, I want to talk about just the first three scriptures in 1 Corinthians 13. There's 13 scriptures. We're going to look at three today. And these are the three points. Number one, let's start in verse one. 1 Corinthians 13, verse one. It says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And I'm a drummer, and I like clanging cymbals and playing gongs, but this is not that kind of same thing. Not the same. I don't want to be that. So I have a question for you. Have you ever tried to learn a new language? So when I was, when I was in school, in eighth grade, eighth grade all the way up through high school, I took five years of Spanish. I made it to AP Spanish. And I loved taking it. I had great teachers. Loved it at Silver Creek. And then once I got out of high school, I, I, I graduated, and I went to IUS, and, and I tested out of a couple of years of Spanish. And and, uh, and I took a couple years more uh, when I was in college. And when I got to college, man, completely different level. Like in high school, they'd come and they'd at least talk to you in English and, you know, teach you some things. In college, it was, yo quiero Taco Bell. You know, like they only spoke in Espanol the whole time. Like you couldn't even, no preguntas en inglés. Solamente Espanol, por favor. Learning a new language can be challenging. It's a lot of work. It's not, it's not exactly easy. I remember having to spend a lot of dedicated time looking at like flashcards and vocab tests and all that kind of stuff. Conjugations, man. Although I will say this, it helped me to understand English a little bit better because English is a funky language. We only have one word for love. I mean, what's up with that? <laughs> but learning, learning a new language, I... I, I applaud you if you can speak another language. And I know several people who actually can speak multiple languages, like five and six different languages. That is, is, is pretty incredible. That's an incredible feat because I think about that and I think, okay, the reason for me to learn another language is so that I can communicate with someone who doesn't speak the same language as me, right? I'm trying to communicate with them. I'm trying to understand what they're trying to say or I'm trying to speak to them so that they understand what I'm trying to say. And so for someone who can speak in multiple languages, they have an ability to, to communicate to multiple different areas that, well, maybe I could never actually reach because I can't speak your language. So they can be great communicators. Well, and speaking of communicators, I know a couple people who are actually just, they're really eloquent speakers. They're very good at getting their point across and they're, and they're, they're, they're engaging and they're exciting. And every time that I talk with them, I feel like I understand something. Like I, I get something from that conversation because of the way that they speak. They're very, very good, very concise. They always know the right words. And they're, you, you know what I'm talking about, powerful speakers? Like whether you know them or not, maybe you've seen them on TV, uh, but, but people who, who really, they're great orators. They know how to stir people up and, and get their point across. They're, they're, they're very, 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 very good at communicating. Well, I'm looking at this scripture and I'm seeing, hmm, you know, it tells us that it doesn't matter how many languages we can speak or how well we can communicate because if we don't do it in love, then we say nothing. Then we say absolutely nothing. So it doesn't matter how many languages I can speak, whether I can speak of the tongues of men or of angels. If I don't do it with love, I say nothing. And that's what Paul is writing here. And you know, this actually, 
I think would hit home pretty well with the people of that time, the Greek culture, especially because um, at that time, they, they, they really had a, an, an admiration and an emphasis for great orators. Kind of, I mean, we do too here in America, but, 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 but more so at that time, they, they really had a, a, a great emphasis on being able to speak eloquently and telling great stories and, 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 and listening to the one person up on the mountain speaking. And, you know, that, that, was a big, that was a big deal in their culture at the time. And so for Paul to say, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker you are, if you don't speak in love, then you're saying nothing. Like that would hit home pretty hard, Right? Another interesting thought or thing that, that sticks out to me is, is on this where it says, uh, if I have not love, I'm like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Why would he choose those words specifically? Back in, in, in ancient times, pagan, pagan religion, what they would do, one of the things they would do is use gongs or cymbals to get the attention or wake their pagan gods. Have you ever seen Mulan? The movie Mulan, Mushu has that job where he goes and he clangs the, the gong to wake up the gods and so that people can, they could be in communication. So Paul is essentially saying, and let this be very clear because this is kind of, whoa, that when I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, then I am no better than those who do not know God and they are, I'm like a clanging cymbal. I'm like, whoa. If you speak without love, you're no better than the pagans who don't even know the Lord. Like, that's, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Because without love, you say nothing. Without love, I say nothing. Say that with me. Without love, I say nothing. Without love, we say nothing. Let's move on to verse two. Verse two says, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Paul is referring to three of the spiritual gifts that he actually talked about in the chapter uh, prior. Prophecy is the ability to declare God's truth in a powerful and life-changing way. If you've ever received a prophecy, whether here or somewhere else, I'm I'm walking through some of those right now. It is very true and very real. Knowledge involves deep understanding, and specifically with the word of God, understanding all things. Being able, can, you, can you just imagine, just for a second, having a gift that when somebody explains something to you, say we're, I'm explaining to you quantum physics, that you were able to understand it like that, to be able to understand knowledge. Faith is the unique ability to trust God for great things. We talked about faith a little bit uh, a couple of weeks ago and what faith is. And so Paul is talking about all of these things, and these are all uh, great gifts from the Holy Spirit, and they're great things. He's not saying that these are bad things or that they're worthless, but what he is saying is that a person who has them but does not love is nothing, that it doesn't matter about how great your gifts are. If you don't have love, then you are nothing. The part that sticks out to me is, is pretty cool is about the understanding and, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge is what it says specifically. Just think about that just for a second. If you had the ability to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, which means that you could, you could literally understand anything. So I could figure out all the mysteries of God. I could figure out all of the mysteries of our world and understand all of the concepts and things going on in our world. So I could understand how to solve world hunger. What if you had that kind of understanding? Or um, I have such understanding that I could go through and solve world, and have, we'd have world peace because I could solve all the cultural differences and everything else, all the mysteries that, are, that go there. I could solve all of those things. That sounds like a pretty great thing, right? It'd be pretty awesome to be able to solve every single puzzle in the world and to know all things. That would be a pretty incredible thing. But suppose all that is true. If you don't have love, according to what we just read, then you are nothing. That's a pretty powerful statement. And it's easy to brush through these first three verses when reading this chapter because we want to get to what is love, what does love say? But that's why I wanted to stop and I wanted to look at this because of what Paul writes. These are actually very poignant words that even if I am able to operate in all of these great things, if I don't have love, 
I am nothing. If you don't have love, you are nothing. Say it with me. If I don't have love, I am nothing. Wow, that's, that is powerful stuff. Let's go to the third one. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. This one is really good because it looks at, takes things that we think are noble and are good and right, giving to the poor and giving up my body and myself. And we talked about, at Christmas, we talked about how these things, yes, they can be perceived as good and how we judge as people judge on the outside and judge deed and what we see taking place, but that the Lord judges on the heart. And, and, and what is our motivation? Because I can, I can give all the money that I have away to the poor, but if my motivation is so that someone else can see me doing this and take note and take, uh, take account of what I'm doing and, 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 and lift me up and, and say, wow, what a great guy he is, that he can go and he can give all away his money to the poor, give away all his money to the poor. If that's my motivation, then that's a wrong motivation. We have to be motivated out of love, which is what the scripture talks about. And so... Even you can take something as noble as giving all your money away to the poor. You can take something as noble as giving up your life and sacrifice for someone else. I can give up my life for you as, 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 and duty and obligation. But if my motivation is not out of love, then I gain nothing. That's what the scripture is saying. So just think about that for a second. What if you had enough money that you could sit here today, write a check, and pay off this building? How many of y'all would want to do that? I would love to have that kind of money to just say, right now, you know what? That's nothing. Psh, take care of it. And in fact, you know what? Here's a million more dollars to go plant a church in the ghetto. And you know what? While you're at it here, take another couple million to, to, to the homeless shelter and, and help them. And, and you know what? And, and the abusive clinics. And to be that kind of generous person to be able to have that kind of, a, of, a, of an income and money. I would love that. But Paul is saying that even if you did that, even if you could do all of those things, but you had not love, it profits you nothing. You gain nothing because it's all about love first. While those things are good things, while giving your life for someone else is good, while, while giving money to the poor is a good thing, to be able to do all those kinds of things are good things. If I don't have love, then I gain nothing. Without love, you gain nothing. Say that with me. Without love, I gain nothing. You seeing a theme here? We're getting, we're getting a pattern here? Worship team, come on up. Without love, I say nothing. Without love, I am nothing. And without love, I gain nothing. Those are just the first three scriptures in this passage. Love, that to me tells me how powerful and how great love is, that all three of these things mean absolutely nothing without love. Here's an illustration. What's the biggest number that you can think about? Picture that in your mind, whether it's a, a million or a billion or a trillion or a quadrillion or a quintillion or however far it goes. Pick a number. Now take that number and multiply it by five. And then you have five million, five trillion, etc. Then take that number and multiply it by another huge number. You could get an astronomically huge number, right? You could keep going and have these massive numbers. Okay, so take that large number that you have now and multiply it by zero. And what do you get? Anything multiplied by zero, you get See, I think God is saying that a life without love is zero. And that no matter what big numbers we may have, no matter what great things that we may do, when we do it without a life of love, then we multiply by zero and it means nothing. At least in his eyes, it means nothing. A life without love is zero. And that's why we're starting with love first. We love first. God demonstrated his agape kind of a love towards us when he sent Jesus to die for us. God's, scripture tells us that God's love was demonstrated that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So even when we were making bad mistakes and we were doing the things that 
did not please God, that did not align with his will, did not go with what he wants us to be, who he wants us to be. He loved us anyway. He loved first. And we love because he first loved us. And we have the capability to love like he loves because of the agape love that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Love first today. So stand with me, please. You can add up all of the good deeds and the education and the spiritual gifts, and you could be a beautiful person. You could be strong and wealthy and have a great heart and multilingual and rich, but if you don't have love, then you're nothing. And I think that these three verses can challenge us to some, some personal examination, to look w- within ourselves and say, how am I responding? Am I responding out of love? Am I responding out of agape love? Or am I responding out of my feelings of hurt or, or anger? Or where am I responding? Am I responding emotively? Is it emotion? Is that what's driving my response? Because if it is, then, then, then we're not responding out of the agape kind of a love that we are called to respond with. Because remember, agape love is a willful response. It's a choice to say, I choose to love you. So today, I just want to encourage you to choose love. Choose agape love first, regardless of what's going on in your life. And regardless of uh, uh, if, if it's a, we can all probably imagine a person in our life that brings a little bit of stress that it's hard to be around. Maybe it's a family member. You know, we just got out of the holidays. Maybe it was hard for some of you to go see family because it just brings out some frustrations and it's hard. Maybe there's some wounds there. I want to challenge you today to examine yourself and to allow the Holy Spirit to examine you and to be humble enough to say, Lord, I want to love like you. I want to have a heart like you. I may have done it wrong in the past. I may do it wrong some in the future, but I'm choosing to give you my heart. And I'm choosing to put on your agape love today. So that way when I do encounter my my boss who is a real butt, when when I encounter him, I choose to see him as how you see him. And I choose to love him how you love him, despite my feelings, despite his actions. I still choose to love because that is your kind of a love. That's love first. That's what it is. Pray with me this morning. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And God, the the fact that you loved us first and you loved us so much that you would send your son to die for us, we acknowledge that. We thank you for that and we receive it too. And we receive, Holy Spirit, the love of God, the agape love in our hearts that that, that you shed in our hearts. We receive that and we choose today to walk in that and to operate in that, to, to, to walk in a, to be walking representations of your love, God, to be heart walkers, to, to, to walk your heart and to share your heart with the world so that they can see the kind of love that you are, the, the, the agape love that, that is your character and is your nature and is your being. Lord, we choose today to, to, to walk in that, to willfully walk in that with no strings attached, not out of obligation, but because we want to, because you've commanded us to. Lord, we want to honor you and glorify you today. And I just speak that over your people. Maybe, may we be filled with your love and maybe we walk in your kind of a love today, even as we leave this place and go back to our homes and our families and our jobs, Lord, that, that, that something would be different, that there would be a change in our lives and, and, and that people would take notice and there would be opportunities for us to share your gospel and your good news and your love with the world, Father. We want to bring you glory and we want to bring you honor in everything that we say and everything that we do. And and we humbly submit ourselves to you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. And right now, let's worship the Father together.